So let's say you're looking to purchase a new laptop, desktop or CPU, but when you look at all of the variants, all you get is a face full of labels and marketing materials that really only help to confuse you rather than inform you. So the aim of this video is to try and cut through all that mess and approach something close to understanding the mess. <laughs> Let's get to it. How about we start with Intel? Intel's full product range consists of the Celeron, the Pentium, the Core M, the Atom, the Core i3, Core i5, Core i7, and Core i9, and Xeons. Yeah, it's pretty big. There are more, however, most of these aren't using consumer PC tech, such as Quark and Itanium. Okay. So Celeron processors are mostly found in budget laptops, but they are also released for the PC. And these tend to be dual core processors without hyper threading. So you get two cores and two threads. Low level three cache, less advanced functionality, uh, as well as a low TDP, which means it runs, so which means it'll run cooler. Thanks to the performance target of uh, Celerons, the price is often around 60 USD. This makes it for a great home theater PC or a crypto coin mining rig. <laughs> All right, so moving on, moving on to Pentium, the product has a very famous name with its uh, lineage going all the way back to 1993. It's virtually a, a household name as Intel really pushed the marketing for Pentium back in the day. These days, Pentiums are found as either dual cores or quad cores in, in laptops, or a dual core desktop processor with hyper threading, meaning it has two cores, but four threads. However, since 2017, Intel split Pentium into two lineups, Pentium Silver, and Pentium Gold. Pentium Silver aims at low powered uh, devices and shares the same architecture with Atom and the uh, Celeron processors. Whereas the Pentium Gold aims for entry level desktop, office PC, budget gaming sort of fields and uses the existing architecture found in the higher end products such as Kaby Lake or Coffee Lake and pretty much all the way back and forward. Pentiums tend to be priced at about 80 to 100 USD. Pentiums are often higher cached and slightly higher clocked while keeping a low TDP, thus uh, detaching it from the Celeron series. Let's get to the next two now, as these are sort of bundled up and can get quite confusing. These two are solely ultra low power devices, such as laptops, netbooks, ultrabooks, and in embedded devices, such as healthcare machines and robotics. These are the Intel Atom and Core M. The Atom series, as of when this video was recorded, could only clock as high as 2.6 gigahertz, whereas the Core M could only reach about 1.3, 1.2, 1 1.3 gigahertz. However, the M3 has a greater efficiency with a 4.5 watt TDP. The Atom uh, varies depending on the model. All right, so let's just push that to the side. Okay, now we move on to the mainstream core series, starting off with the Core i3. Launching in 2010 as a dual core processor that used to be slightly higher clocked than its multi-core counterparts. However, with the sixth generation uh, processors uh, released a few years ago in 2016, Intel decided to make the i3s 
dual core with hyper threading. So it's two cores or threads, which gave them more processing power. And since the eighth generation in 2018, they are now quad cores, thanks to the entry level quad core competition from AMD's Ryzen 3. The i3 is designed and marketed for entry level budget gaming office sort of PC and therefore is marketed between 130 and 180 USD. This is a bit of a tricky situation as the i5s had a lot of change within the first few years. With the first gen of Core i5 there were two variants in regards to core count. The i5-600 series, so that's the processors like the i5-650, 660, 661, and so on, were dual cores, and the i5-700 series, such as the 750 and the 760, were all quad cores. Just like the i3s jumped to quad core CPUs in the eighth generation, the i5s became a hexa-core chip, meaning that it had six cores within the chip, to compete with Ryzen 5's six cores, 12 threaded component. These are great for a high entry-level gaming PC or about a mid-range gaming PC, depending on what model you get, and as such are priced between 200 and 260 USD. Now, Way back in the day, these, these used to be the kings of CPUs, being only the best of the best, and in a way, they still are. Well, not in a way, they're quite frankly, still fantastic performers. When the first i7 launched, it could only be used on the Enthusiast X58 platform, as the CPU sockets on those motherboards use the LGA1366 socket and no other core series processor was ever made for that platform. However, a year later the i7s were introduced into the mainstream platform with the only way to differentiate the two versions was the product code. The X58 versions were called the i7900 series and the mainstream version the i7800 series. The i7s used to have the highest core and thread count in the whole in the whole product stack, but with the recent generation, it's now the second highest. The i7s can be found on the enthusiast platforms too, such as the, the famous i7-3930K on the X79 platform, or the i7-5960X on the X99 platform. And these broke the mainstream core count convention, with these often being six cores 12 threaded, or even eight cores 16 threaded, or even higher. The i7s tend to be the more expensive components, and for previous generations, the most expensive. Except for the generations where the i9 option was available. Mainstream i7s tend to be priced at around three to 400 USD, uh, whereas the enthusiast option costs around about the $500 to $600 mark. Now, when it comes to consumer processors from Intel, this is what gamers demand. And Intel delivers. Also, their marketing would claim. <laughs> so the Core i9 CPUs are extremely popular in 2019 and are touted as the best gaming CPUs and, well, they're, they're not wrong. However, the Core i9 is only enjoying its first run in the consumer mainstream market. Despite the moniker or naming scheme or brand, whatever you want to call it, being in use for two years now. The first Core i9 was produced exclusively for the enthusiast platform with its flagship, the Core i9-7980XE, costing over a thousand USD, and even to this day, costs around a thousand USD. But that's not to say it didn't deliver on even higher core counts 
with 10 cores and 20 threads. It was and still is a beast. Moving to 2019, Intel's flagship processor, the Core i9-9900K. And for gaming, it is the best. However, it does come with the infamous Intel tax coming in at 500 USD. Oh, so, <laughs> on to the last segment that we are going to cover today, the Intel Xeon. Xeons have always been marketed to the workstation and server markets, as they often have high core and thread counts, low TDP, ECC memory support, higher amounts of RAM support, higher cache memory, but also other features that are not available on the consumer platforms, such as certain virtualization technologies. You can find Xeons in both mainstream platforms, such as the LGA 1151 sockets, with the Xeon E2288G, which released in the second quarter of 2019, very recent, and the server platforms, such as the Xeon Platinum 8180, which runs on the LGA 3647 socket. Thanks to its reliability, its aimed market, and its high core counts, to name a few, Xeons tend to be really expensive, with the two-year-old Xeon Platinum 8180 costing over 10,000, which is why I almost cried when Linus from Linus Tech Tips dropped it, which I'll leave a link to the, the description below. It's really quite... <sighs> <laughs> and he um, really badly uh, damaged it. But some older Xeons are quite affordable, such as the old X3450s, which use the first generation socket, the LJ1156, and actually turns those old systems into extremely capable budget systems. Intel do make some ASIC or application specific integrated circuit products, no, no, not ASICs like you've probably heard of in regards to crypto mining, but, but it provides products for devices like low powered medical devices, fridges, smart fridges, smart home tech, uh, smart slash self-driving cars, uh, server farms, compute pro, sorry, compute co-processors and more. Um, some, some of these are called, like I've said before, Quark. Titanium and Xeon Phi. But since these don't really interact or affect the mainstream consumer markets, you don't really have to worry about them. And as such, I'm not going to be going in any deeper. So I hope I have helped you understand what some of these products are marketed towards and what they really are. And I know that this was really long and I'm sorry for that. Um, but I wanted to explain this as, as uh, thoroughly as I could. So thank you for watching. Please leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Smash that subscribe button if you want more tech videos coming your way. And hopefully I will see you all in the next one.